You know, I was ambassador to Israel for four years. I know how important is the role of ambassador. Uh, sitting on the stage with me is really one of the great uh, ambassadors of the U.S.-Israel relationship. He's done wonderful things to make a real Kiddush Hashem, and to make, put Israel in its greatest light. So I'm greatly honored to be with you, Omri Kaspi. I want to, I want to thank uh, Amiad Cohen for putting this all together. Um, he's done an outstanding job. It was, it was great to see my, my partner, uh, Khalid Al Jalama. We have known each other for a while now. We were working on the Abraham Accords before anybody knew about the Abraham Accords. And uh, as you heard, he's, he's the right person uh, here at the right time in the right job. Um, and I, I'll just remind of a funny story before I get started. Um, seeing uh, Benny Zomer here, I remember when uh, Noble Energy was acquired by Chevron. And uh, Benny got me on the phone with um, the president of Chevron, and I congratulated him on, on his purchase, and he invited me to uh, jump on a helicopter and fly out to the gas rig out in the Mediterranean. So I put in my calendar, uh, you know, meeting at Chevron. And uh, the next day, because my calendar was public in the embassy, the next day, a bunch of, you know, white, white-faced, uh, diplomats came running into my office, petrified, and they said, you can't do this. And I said, I can't do what? They said, you can't go to Chevron. I said, uh... <laughs> okay, so we fixed all that anyway. Um, so, you know, one of my first clear recollections from my childhood was in early 1967. I was nine years old. I come downstairs for breakfast, and I see my parents in tears. Uh, thank God nobody got hurt, uh, no one had died. Uh, they were crying because the Israeli Defense Forces had just recaptured Jerusalem, and Rabbi Shlomo Gorin was blowing the chauffeur at the Western Wall. I, I, I completely, I will admit, I completely failed to understand the magnitude of the moment. At that time, I came a bit closer in August of 1971, four years later when I observed my bar mitzvah at that same Western Wall. Since then, I have been for about 40 years, a little bit more, a frequent visitor to Israel and a defender of its eternal capital, Jerusalem. Uh, I love the words of the famous song HaKotel, Yesh Avanim, Yesh Anashim Im Lev Shel Evan, Yesh Avanim Im Lev Adam. I, I truly believe that there are people with hearts of stone, and then there are stones with the hearts of people. And I truly believe that the ancient stones of Jerusalem are beating today with the heart, the blood, and the soul of the Jewish nation. Some, some five years ago, I stopped being just a visitor to Israel. I became the United States ambassador to Israel, the representative of the most powerful nation on earth to the Jewish state. And I was privileged to lead American policy in so many ways, both public and private. The public advancements in the U.S.-Israel relationship, while we were in office, they're well known. We moved our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, where it will always remain. We recognized Israeli sovereignty over Ramat HaGolan, over the Golan Heights. We determined, we determined that Jewish people have the right to live in their biblical homeland. Uh, settlement in Judea and Samaria is not, is not illegal under international law. And then we finished up with the Abraham Accords, peace agreements between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco. And they came about, they came about not in spite of, but precisely because of our unconditional support for the State of Israel. We approached Israel from a completely different and, I think, a unique perspective. In contrast to our predecessors, both Democrat and Republican, we saw Israel as a solution in the Middle East to be embraced and nurtured rather than a problem to be managed. And we relied on Israel to know and decide what is best for its own citizens. 
We saw all the condescending paternalism that marked the treatment of past administrations as truly unbecoming, unbecoming for a first world nation and ally like the State of Israel. Now, from time to time, a political or intellectual figure on the Israeli left would beg me, beg me to stop interfering in Israeli politics. And I would reply that I was doing just the opposite. I was trying to help empower Israel to set its own political course, free finally from efforts from the outside, sometimes encouraged from within, to undo Israel's democratic will. We respected Israel. We respected it as the one and only Jewish state. We respected it as a vital partner in the fight against terrorism and extremism. We respected it as a center of science, technology, and commerce. And we respected it as a vibrant democracy managing peacefully a vast diversity of opinions. My friends, and I say this from a position of true love, we respected Israel, and now I believe it's time for Israel to respect itself. I know the challenges of Israeli society and the complexities of a parliamentary democracy. No U.S. president has ever been forced to build a cabinet comprised of his political opponents. That's exactly what happens in every Israel government. I get it. It's very difficult. But that cannot reduce every Israeli government to its lowest common denominator. When that happens, the long-term interests of the Israeli public are neglected. There are about 190 countries in the United Nations. More than half are younger than Israel. Almost all have a lower GDP per capita than Israel. Almost all are far behind Israel and their respective militaries or intelligence capabilities or their technological advancements or their intellectual depth. Israel has earned the right to chart its own path. It is time for Israel to decide what it wants to be now that it has grown up. We're here at a, conservative, at a conference on conservatism. I endorse most of the conservative principles that have been articulated from a limited judiciary, a pro-business regulatory env environment, a transparent economy, many other good ideas and governing principles that have been expressed earlier today. I will leave it to the many experts with whom I share this stage to continue to defend these ideas as they did so well earlier today. What I will address, however, is something I've come to learn a little bit about, the importance of Israel, and only Israel, being responsible for its direction as a nation, and especially as the only Jewish state. A grown-up nation decides for itself, by itself, what is best for its citizens. As critical as it is for Israel to maintain good relations with its allies, especially my country, the United States. First, Israel must determine through its democratic channels what is the right course and only then to make its case to the rest of the world. Since, since 1948, Israel has managed its relationship with the United States as its principal foreign ally. From president to president, it has recalibrated its approach to maintain this allowance as best it can. So Truman was great, Eisenhower was terrible, Kennedy was okay, Johnson good, Nixon very good, Ford not so much, Carter a disaster other than Camp David, Clinton a good friend, meant well, George W. Bush generally okay, Obama not so good, Trump unbelievable, and then... <laughs> and, and then Biden. I get it, I get it. The relationship is important, but bouncing around to suit the policies and eccentricities of a foreign power is not what I would consider good governments. I, I promise you that no one in the Oval Office is worrying what the Prime Minister of Israel thinks when they make their policies. I don't think you should handle it any other way. So without minimizing the importance of the U.S.-Israel relationship, and it is important, it is a strategic imperative, as someone who has sat for four years in the innermost meetings of both American and Israeli leadership, I say again,
from a perspective of love, Israel must do what is best for Israel, first, last, and always. I believe, I believe that America first, but not America only, is the right policy for America. I believe that Israel first, but not Israel only, is the right policy for Israel. And I believe that both countries have so much in common and so much good to share that these policies can coexist in harmony and I think they can flourish. Israel first, Israel first means that Israel bases its policy upon a national consensus as what is in its best interests and defends that policy without condition or apology. And I am convinced that the world will respect Israel when Israel respects itself. So let's just talk about one issue. There's lots of issues. Let's talk about one issue, one which I worked on extensively when I was in office, when I was U.S. Ambassador to Israel. I'll ask all of you a question. It's a question, by the way, that at least, at least 95% of all nations in the world have no trouble answering. Here's the question. What is Israel's eastern border? <laughs> Sounds simple, right? Simple. I mean, it's the longest border. It's mostly alongside the Kingdom of Jordan. What's the border? Some will say it's the Jordan River. Some will say it's the Armistice Line of 1949. Some will say it's the settlement blocks, whatever that means. Plus a strip along the river for national defense. Most politicians will say that at least some portion of Judea and Samaria will always be Israel. Ask them which portion it is, and they have no clear response. And then some say they can't answer because the Palestinians don't want to make peace, thereby deferring this decision until forever. My friends, Israel must decide this issue because I can guarantee you one thing. If any other body or any other nation decides this issue, very few in Israel will be happy with the outcome. So, my, so I would encourage you, begin the debate. Make the arguments, make the respective cases, evaluate the arguments, create a national consensus and a plan with confidence and with pride, respect yourselves and your right, I would say your sacred obligation to chart the right course for the Jewish state. That's what a grown-up nation does. Not everyone will agree with you, but everyone will respect you. Right now, the discourse is entirely confusing and unconvincing. Every political leader since Menachem Begin, including by the way, Yitzhak Rabin, and those associated with the peace camp, have committed to a sizable presence of the state of Israel in Yudav Shomron. But what is it? There are lots of slogans and songs about various communities always being inside Israel. But if you buy a house in most places in Yudav Shomron, you're not getting tabu. Tabu is not in uh, Yudav Shomron. You're not getting your land registered. You have to deal with the Ministry of Defense. It's been 55 years. Can you imagine a couple dating for 55 years? And the wife says, and the, and, the, and, the, and the woman says to the man, when are we getting married? And the man says, I love you. I, I didn't ask you that. When are we getting married? I, I, my life is nothing without you. And again, when are we getting married? Um, at some point, you know, it's, it's time to get married. It's enough. As my mother would say, you're vulgaring around for 55 years. It's tough. It's in time to get married. Now, you know, there, there were, there were, Efforts, you know, in the past, Israel stood up, but there was a big movement. I remember when I was younger, Ha'am Im Hagalan, and the government of Israel responded, and it recognized its sovereignty over the Golan. It was obviously with Jerusalem right after the 60-day war. Israel recognized sovereignty over Jerusalem. The world might have, you know, there, there was a condemnation of the United Nations. Not everybody agreed, you know, but, but, but Israel was fine. And then we came along, and, and we agreed. And the UN condemned us and said, how dare you recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital? How dare you recognize Ramat HaGolan as part of Israel? We got over it. You know, we got over it. And, and, and you'll get over it, too. Um, and not only did we get over it, not only did we get over it, we actually managed after that to achieve historic Abraham Accords with four Muslim nations. So we'll get over it. 
In early 2020, we put out a, we put out a peace plan. It was, it was a trial balloon. It was endorsed by the entire Israeli defense establishment as well as the Israeli government. It showed how Israel could obtain sovereignty over its biblical homeland and still live in peace with the Palestinians. Nothing's been said about that plan since we lost the election. It's a shame. Um, and I'm not here to advocate for it. But it was, a, it was an important discussion piece of nothing else. And it was a critical driver of the Abraham Accords. So it's not up to me, but you know, I would dust it off. Again, it's, it's, it's got a lot of good in it. It may not be perfect, it may not be right for Israel, but it's a lot more right than anything anybody else ever came up with. And, uh, and we talked to a lot of smart people and it's worth looking at. Um, it doesn't belong uh, in the dustbin and I'm convinced it will not end up in the dustbin of history, even if that's where our current government would like to put it. So look, I'm not advocating here what Israel's course should be with regard to its eastern border. I don't think it's, I don't think it's really for me to, to advocate that. You all know what I think, but I'm not going to advocate it. But ultimately, the decision rests with the citizenship of the state of Israel, all of the citizens of the state of Israel. And as important as the decision is, it's even more important that Israel decides for itself, by itself, with strength, unity, and conviction. That's what Israel needs to do. So here at this conservatism conference, the future leaders of Israel can begin to think about what kind of a nation they want to empower for their children and grandchildren and for the Jewish people everywhere. It is a daunting responsibility, but as I said, it is a sacred honor to be living at this time in history. This past Yom Ha'atzma'ut, the modern state of Israel surpassed the United Kingdom of David and Solomon as the longest united Jewish commonwealth governed from its capital in Jerusalem. David and Solomon ruled for 73 years, 33 for David, 40 for Solomon. Israel is now 74, so congratulations. You're in first place. I think it entitles you to a very uh, short celebration and then go out and propel Israel to a position of glo global leadership where it can truly serve as a light unto the nations, as an or lagayim. Thank you. Thank you for listening. May God bless you. May God bless Israel. And may God bless the United States of America. Thank you so much.